Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here with professional exorcist Michael Kester. Yeah. And uh, we are doing two films on the show today. That's right, two films. Can I point out that you're not actually a professional exorcist? Right. I don't want people to think you con people for a living. No, I will, not with exorcism. <laughs> no. Just uh, you come on the show as if you have any idea what you're talking about. That's and about people right. be- They believe us week after week. Mm-hmm. I have trouble believing that. We have two films today. Yep. We're going to do Stuck and House of the Devil. I'm just going to say these are two damn good films. Yeah, they are. I'm fine with that. But uh, we have City Dangerous versus Suburb Dangerous right. on the show today. Right. Uh, which is, you know what? Fuck it. That's enough of a, <laughs> that's enough of a theme for me. We're going to spoil these movies. Um, you know, I would be really bummed if someone spoiled me about either of these films. However, they're still really good movies. Stuck, I mean, I know what happens in Stuck. I've seen it before, yet I would still watch it anytime. Mm-hmm. I would walk right by a TV where Stuck is on, and I would sit down and watch it. You'd be stuck. And, and thank you for that. Is that out now? You've you've gotten that out? You know no. Uh, oh, Jesus. House of the Devil, I mean, you never get it like that first time. Yep. There are additional things that uh, that you kind of pull from it the second time you see it, mm-hmm. um, and the, the further times you see it, it gets better with rewatches. But also, man, the first fucking time and you don't know what's going on, uh, it's just amazing. So don't spoil yourself on that. Instead, use chapters. If you have seen Stuck but not House of the Devil, you can listen to that part and then skip House of the Devil. You know what? Skip it and then come back after you've seen it and listen to the show. It's really fucking short. Both of these are pretty short. Stuck is, uh, let's say it's a random film by Stuart Gordon. We could have done any Stuart Gordon film. But, you know, all that stuff going on with the music box stuck with something that was so untouched. Uh, It's so distant from the other Stuart Gordon stuff we've kind of gone over. But what else has he done? Stuart Gordon's done Reanimator. He did Bride of Reanimator. Um, He did From Beyond. He did the Masters of Horror thing, The Black Cat. The Black Cat, sure. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. You can't forget that. That is a weird He wrote uh, it. He didn't direct that. Yeah, maybe that's why it came out as a passable kids film. And not uh, brutal. Space truckers, also space truckers. There, you have Dennis Hopper one. trucking through space. So Stuck tells us that it's a true story. Yeah. Normally we would be pretty wary of this. Based on actual events. In fact, both of these films based on actual events. <laughs> no, no. One of these is based on actual. They events. both claim to be based well, on actual events. That's probably in any. Here's the thing. In any other show we do, that would be equally as true. But I actually think that Stuck does a pretty good job in in the based part. If you look at what it's literally saying, based on actual events, the actual events they're talking about are really accurate. It's the based part where the uh, the deviation from that comes in. You know, the actual events, they're not talking about characters. They're talking about events. Sure. So we know a lot more about the characters in this movie right. than we do from, say, police reports. Why don't you just tell everybody what the actual event was, and then we'll expand from there into what the film does with it. Well, okay, so briefly, actual event is the same thing as the movie. Same synopsis. Uh, chick is drunk or high. I don't actually have the police report in front of me. You That's put okay. me on the spot here. But she nails a homeless guy with her car drags him back to her house because she doesn't want to call the police and ends up leaving him sitting in the garage while probably fucking her boyfriend sure uh, in the house the next day wakes up and the guy's dead and she gets away with the crime or she gets away with it for quite a bit until she brags about that to some other people you know six months or something right. later and they bust her and she got uh, i think she got 50 years in jail or something you know 25 years after parole but but that's it. That's the event. And you know what? There was another movie based on it and two different. There was, a, I think, a Law and Order and a CSI or one of the many CSI. Fuck CSI. Don't care. Right. But now you know. Actual events. So I like the way um, of all the Stuart Gordon stuff that's in stock. I like the way he's weaving this story right from the beginning. You know, when we talked uh, to Stuart Gordon and heard him, uh, when we heard the presentation he gave, mm-hmm. uh, the Q&A and whatever sure. happened at the music box. He was talking, and this was the first time, you know, I'd heard Eli Roth talk about this a little bit, but first time I really thought about that, what things are terrifying at the time? What was going on in the 50s that made 50s monster movies work? 
What was going on in the 70s that made people afraid of the 70s shit? What's going on in House of the Devil that right. makes people afraid of that stuff? And then what worked in the 90s? And, you know, now what is terrifying people? Movies uh, like Hostel, you know, that whole sure. kind of wave of stuff. Why does that scare people? And so when I watch a Stuart Gordon movie, I know he's concentrating on that specifically. So rather than that being an effect of the success of a movie where you go, okay, so you know, X, Y, or Z movie became popular. Rosemary's Baby became yeah. popular. It probably became popular because it worked, and here's why it worked. Instead, Stuart Gordon knows this way ahead of time. He doesn't just make a movie based on what he would like to make a movie about. What he would like to make a movie about is what's freaking people out. So he kind of starts with that premise, and I know I can look for that intent. Right. We begin the story with Tom Bardo, and I'm going to tell you why I'm a complete sucker in just All a right. second. But Tom Bardo, we get this huge buildup. He, he's out of his job, and he's going back to... He's new homeless, sure. right? New Which, homeless. by the way, if you know a movie about new homeless, double feature show at gmail.com, people who are freshly homeless. It's their first day out on the street. They still have the clean clothes. They're meeting other homeless people. This is something that I, until I become homeless, I guess, until people stop donating to our show, right. I will never know what it's like to be new homeless. There is a separation between us, residents of Chicago, uh -huh. and people on the street asking for Who are homeless and hungry. And I will never understand. There's, such a, there, there's a huge gap. There's a disconnect there. And I will never know what that's like. So the concept of new homeless finally crossing over to their yeah. side, that's really interesting to me. But he's new homeless. We feel bad for him. Um, we're meant to feel really fucking bad for yeah. this guy. Now, you have a cold heart, so you don't feel nearly as bad well, for him I, as you should. I don't know. I feel it's a little cartoonish. I mean, it is. It's come incredibly on. cartoonish. There is too much going. I don't. And, and the other thing that we kind of noticed going on through the film is I'm never really rooting for him. No, you're not. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I'm not really ever rooting for him to lose either. I, you know, title of the film, I want him to be in that car for the rest of his life. Yeah, right. Not not for any malicious intent, but I just want him to be stuck. I want, you know, he gets a... It's the exploitation in you, man. Yeah, I just want him to get, you know, a telemarketing job. Right. Start cooking meals with the cigarette lighter. I don't know. He just... He, All while in the He, he in adapts the car. to living in yeah, the windshield right. of this car. But you're right about him being a cartoon. I mean, that's something that... That's the comedic element of the film is how over the top car. he's out of a job he's getting kicked out of his house his landlord wants to steal all his possessions right. he's just oh you're allowed to leave but i get all your stuff until you can pay he goes to the fucking what is it the employment agency right. or whatever and he's and it's not a dummy experience this time where right. somebody vera farmiga is really helpful to adrian brody instead it's i don't you're not in our computer sir yeah you're not in our computer so you already uh, are supposed to identify with this guy because of you know, this is 2007. This is the beginning of the American financial crisis. So that's the thing Stuart Gordon's focusing on right here. Uh, a character who is down on his luck. He's feeling what a lot of people at the time are feeling. Uh, if you want to reverse that, a movie like Up in the Air that came out mm. was a movie that focused on downsizing. Right. And that was a big thing happening in culture at the time. And part of why I think, anyways, that movie was a success, you know, financially. Right. So this guy doesn't have a job. Boo-hoo, feel bad for him. He goes to the agency. He's trying to get a job. And because of bureaucracy, I mean, it would have been one thing if he fucked up and you say to yourself, oh, he fucked up. It's too bad. But it's bureaucracy. Right. I mean, no one can agree with bureaucracy. At that point, everyone is going, even you, sir, are going, oh, they, they lost this thing in the computer. Well, that's stupid. What the right. fuck? Well, what I'm actually thinking is, dude, why don't you just go sit down in the fucking front room, fill it out, and hand it to this guy? Well, he said you got to mail it in. Yeah, I That's don't how buy bureaucracy that. works. Fuck mail it in. Well, bureaucracy, got to mail you it. You can't buy stamps. Now I'm starting to feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> but he was trying. That's the point. So here's why I'm a complete fucking sucker. Uh, I just, I totally release myself to a film when I see it. I watch this film, I sit down, and I forget everything i'm supposed to know about the movie i forget the title of the movie i forget the poster of the movie i just blank slate when i start watching a film i don't want to have any preconceptions so what i'm asking myself as we're going to mina savari's character and then going back to tom you're laughing me when i tell you this i go how are these two going to be connected yeah <laughs> Uh, physically yeah, is the answer phys physically is the answer yeah and the whole time i'm watching this with suspense on the edge of my seat going wow i cannot wait to see how these two stories right. intermingle sure. until she nails him with the it's really not until he walks into right. the street that i first said to myself 
I bet he's the one that gets stuck in the windshield. You know, maybe the reason the root of my kind of blasé attitude towards Mr. Tom Whiny Pants. Can you just call it dickishness? Sure. I think okay. That's... Yeah. I guess I shouldn't. I shouldn't flower it up. My dickishness towards Mr. Tom Whiny Pants is that's better. Is that he crosses on a green light and gets hit by a car? I mean, I've never done that. You are such a prick. <laughs> so this car crash is one of the most amazing moments oh, yeah. in the film. Well, so we're watching this, yeah. and he's crossing on a green light, and, and we're sitting there, and I'm just going, are you ready for this? This is really brutal. <laughs> this is a really brutal scene. And I thought you, go, you were making fun of it, because I know you <laughs> want Tom to get hit by a car, because you're such a fucking jerk. And you go, you go, oh, yeah, no, I know, I know. And the bumper hits his leg. <sighs> And you, you curl up into a little Eric Ingram ball, oh, God. which I only see on the rarest of occasions. <laughs> right. And I mean, that it just starts there. It starts with the leg yep. shattering against the bumper. So he, first of all, this whole thing is in slow motion, but it's not in lifeless motion. It's not that usual um, saving Private Ryan slow motion. You can't hear any sound. Whoa, isn't that weird? Or look at the the ballet of the events that are happening. It's not in the director masturbatory slow motion where he's so proud of what he's crafted. Instead, it's slow motion and really, really loud. They just want to make sure you absorb every single sound, every single action that's going on. The car bumper hits his leg. You see the second. It's it reminds me of Mythbusters, the high speed. Yeah. Where you're you sure. know what's gonna happen. You're waiting for the sure. moment that X, Y, and Z line up in the frame. And then you get the bone crunching sound. You see him fly as a result, of course, over the hood of the car, through the windshield. You have the view from the inside of the glass shattering, his head coming right through. The benefit of slow motion here is that you can continue to cut from inside and outside the car. So you go back outside. It's almost like instant replay. Let's see that again. You go back outside. What does that look like from outside the car, Michael? Let's just see that fly. He flies right through the fucking windshield. Perfect form. Oh, that's great. That's great. Inside, we we have the other team screaming their head off. (laughs) Yeah, right. The glass, the blood, and then, of course, the car just keeps going. You just keep flying down the highway. So that's when we start to get into the struggle over Mina Savari's character. I am open to the possibility. By the end of the movie, she's scum, right? She is I mean, an absolutely we just the, poor the excuse. worst person on planet Earth. She is a poor excuse for for I don't even want to use the word human being. No, unfortunately, no. we have to because that's what she is. Do Not you, the actress. The actress is probably a fine young lady. We're yeah. talking about the character here. She produced the film, so she is an excellent young lady. What I'm wondering though is, even in the beginning, when she's just working at the hospital and being a chick and whatever, she's fine. Do you ever buy that she's a nice person? When does that stop for you? When do you go, you know what, there's no redeeming this character? Definitely in the beginning I buy it. She's, what, willingly showering the shit off of the (laughs) guy from uh, the Wrong Turn movies? And then I love that opening in the hospital too. all the old people against hip hop. Right. (laughs) That's wonderful. Sure. Well, that's Stuart Gordon. Yeah, it certainly is. And then you get, I guess, you know, it's I mean, look, she stops by the hospital she calls 911, sort of. I mean, she starts to call or whatever. Right. There are moments where she at least thinks about doing the right thing, even if only momentarily. You know, I never fully go ahead and say she's a bad person, except maybe when she brings her boyfriend in and decides this motherfucker's got to die. Or when yeah. she comes in, she comes back from work, risks her job to make sure he doesn't call for help. <laughs> yeah, to grab her cell phone and go back. Uh, God, fuck. Yeah, there's there's just nothing redeeming about this character. Not even the the tiny moments of society tells me the right thing to do would be call 911. Right. Because she thinks about herself. Here's the reason that nothing, I don't care what she does, even if she saves him in the end, I don't fucking care. And here's the reason. In this drunken haze, when she gets back, uh, and I love this scene, she is rambling about, you know, she's rambling to her boyfriend or the, the guy who's in the house, whoever the fuck he is rambling off to him about the events, what happened. And uh, you know as you're watching this, he's not going to get the full story. That's Mm -hmm. kind of how she's spitting things out. But she says something that's so telling. She says, man, and I'm up for this promotion too, as if that matters at all. You know, oh yeah, wow, this is really bad timing for me to strike strike a man with my vehicle because I really want to get promoted. I want my extra $2 an hour. I cannot be dealing with a hit and run right now. I, I have a chance to really start making some serious dough, and now there's some homeless guy stuck in my windshield. 
man, I don't, I didn't even plan out what I'm going to make for dinner tonight. Oh, Frozen pizza again. <laughs> I had that like three days ago. This is the worst day ever. So, all right, no hope for her. But Rashid, I'm wondering if he's a bad person. You know, he, okay. So I guess he is. Cause I mean, he's driving drunk. First of all, if you drive drunk, you're a fucking idiot. Yep. There are things I excuse in this life, like smokers. You know, you damage your own health. That's fine. People who wear don't wear seatbelts are kind of stupid, and I'll uh-huh. yell at them. But... How do you feel about people who talk on their cell phone in the car? Yeah, you know, I... Excusable? Um, <laughs> I don't think there should be a law against it is how I feel about that. But God, fucking drunk driving. Are you kidding me? That shit is so inexcusable. But whatever. So he's drunk driving. Bad person. He sells drugs. Bad person. And if that doesn't work for you, he cheats, which, uh, okay, I guess is a big deal or whatever. Bad fucking person. But even he, when he comes back to her place, he walks into that place and says, wow, this is pretty fucked up right here. And he says, go to the police. He basically immediately puts his hands in the air, goes, wow, this is out of my realm of handling. Yeah. I am not the kind of guy that deals with dead homeless men in my girlfriend's garage. Yeah, right. But what he is the kind of guy is the kind that has a ballpoint pen introduced to the back of his brain through his eyeball. Oh, my God. I think the most common thing that we would cry out when watching this movie is, Stuart, why? Yeah. Stuart, come on. God damn it, Stuart. (laughs) So eventually even he gives in. Uh, Mina is just, her character is wonderful at convincing people. And she holds the drug stuff over his head. She sure. basically says... Well, it's blackmail at that point. Yeah, yeah, that's totally what We're it is. We're not talking about Rashid. We're talking about the act where she says that she'll sell him out oh, if he doesn't kill this homeless there was man. a hell, Michael, you would be going straight there. Next movie. So no one has a conscience in this film. You know that you're going to have to identify with the man stuck in the windshield because everyone else is the worst human being on earth. It's that, like I guess I in fall into that group, group right? Yeah, yeah, you too are the... This is just a viewing experience for me. Everyone else, including Michael Kester, worst human being on earth. <laughs> so if you want to see Stuart Gordon's mastery in this movie, I will tell you the specific scene, although they're, they're littered throughout the movie. Absolutely. The car's parked and we're just now coming back to Tom. And he has, I guess it's a, it's shrapnel from the windshield wiper yeah. jammed into his body. And so he's trying to get off of this and he moves up a little bit and he sinks back down and the little piece just sticks in his gut a little more. And it's like, oh God, that sucks. This is painful to watch. And he gets up again sure. and he almost gets the piece out and then it just slides back. Yeah. It just fucking jams in deeper. This is really hard to watch. But then he finally gets off of the windshield wiper blade and you're thinking maybe Maybe there'll be one last thing where he falls on it again. But no, he gets out of it, and then everything is fine. Scene over. That's a relief. (laughs) There goes the tension. And immediately it cuts to the hospital where an old woman, as far as we're concerned as the viewing audience, gets her toe severed by a hacksaw. (laughs) It's really probably, you know, the tip of her. She probably clipped her toenail too short. Yeah, I mean, she's bleeding. So she actually clipped her toe, but both of us flinch as if somebody's uh, getting stabbed by a tiny needle right, yeah and it's like a it's like just the most painful experience i've ever seen with the most little yeah it's nothing it's trivial it's a, they're even joking about it uh, the woman is saying oh no i'm gonna lose a toe people my age lose a right. toe uh meanwhile we just got out of the scene sure. where this man is uh, his arteries are being severed and he's got the, these pieces of shrapnel stuck in him And, you know, that's the other thing is when you first see the scene transition, maybe you let your guard down toward the end of that scene. But once you get the transition, you go, I'm in a hospital now. It's clean and safe. We're clipping some toenails. What could go wrong here? And that's when they they actually take the windshield shrapnel and stab it in your gut as an audience. Exactly. It's like, hey, remember this from last scene? I got you a fucking souvenir. Yeah, the Stuart Gordon for me really comes out so... Throughout the film, people kind of show up at the side of the garage. It's like a fucking zoo exhibit. Yeah, right. It's just the neighborhood stops by, checks out the dying homeless man, goes for a walk, grabs their soccer ball, whatever. But there's the one guy, the one guy that I guess I accidentally called out in the beginning of the film when I said that morning dog walkers are weirdos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, If you're a morning dog walker and you're not a weirdo, double feature show at (laughs) gmail.com. That's all you really need to say. I'm a morning dog walker. I'm not a weirdo. And a picture of yourself naked, please. The dog walker's dog goes running into a conveniently sized hole in the side of the garage. Right. And so we're thinking, oh, the dog's going to lick up the blood and that's going to be gross and the dog's going to get all bloody. But what we're not realizing is that Stuart Gordon is a child at heart. Yes. And he doesn't see a dog and go, dogs lick up blood, dogs lick up anything that they're new to. What Stuart Gordon goes is dogs, they chew on bones. (laughs) Yeah. 
And the only bone in the film, there's one bone in the entire movie. Yep. One bone. Nobody else has skeletons for all the film is concerned. Or only... spines for that matter. <laughs> I think that's what's really going on here. The only bone on the planet is the one sticking out of Tom's uh, right shin. Why? And so this little dog just goes goes up for a nip, goes up for a nibble. Yeah. And Tom is screaming. And yeah. it cuts back to this cute little doggy nibbling on the shattered shin bone. Uh. And then the dog runs out, covered in blood, got into the garbage again, and the little dog walker weirdo kind of walks away. But, you know, you mentioned the spike in the eye. That was another one for me where I was just like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. How much more torture could these people endure? But then there's a perfect moment at the end of the film. And I think if anything was ever going to convince you that Tom's not such a bad guy, right. it's when he's yes. paired off right against Mina Savari's character. You have this moment where the tables turn. She goes in to finally execute this man. That's it. She's examined all her other options. She, well, she's tried to get other people to do it well, for yeah, her. Yeah, but on top of that, don't forget that he actually got out, could have gotten away, could have been clean, could have been over... And she decides to beat him with the hammer and drag him back to the yeah, fucking garage. Right, right. So there was that moment where, you know, she could have ended things there, but she wanted to make sure she wouldn't get caught. You know, her not getting caught is the priority over everything that happens in this man's life, including his torture and death. So comes back in the garage, you know, there's an exchange and eventually the guy gets the upper hand and he drives the car right into her. So we're seeing an obvious parallel to everything that's happening to him. You know, now he's bashed the car into her. She's trapped against the wall, so she can't get away. But now there's also the gasoline that she was pouring all over the garage. He has the matches in his hand, and she starts begging for help, what he's been doing the entire film. So this is a moment, this is the the rape-revenge moment of the film, where it's totally justified in cinema, anyways, for this guy to light the garage on fire and walk away like a badass. And, and I'm every, sitting, everyone will stand up and cheer right. at the end. And I'm sitting there hoping he does it so that I can get some justification as to why he's a bad guy. Right. You know, yeah. I have not been, there's no reason he's a bad man. And at this point, I'm like, yeah, light her on fire, you fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah, Come on, you right. fucking whiny bitch. Right. Light her on fire. But Do he, it. He Make doesn't. Me. That's the thing. No. He I, has the option and he says, you know what? I'm better than you. This is the stuff we only get out of uh, movies like Serenity. You right. know what I mean? It's so rare that this ever happened because cinema is fantasy. And in fantasy, the person who's fucking with you, you smash their head in. But he says, I'm better than that. I'm going to take off. She fucking turns on him again and tries to shoot him. She is the worst character on the face of the planet. So after he does the right thing, he somehow manages to fucking get out of there. Unlike the events that this is actually based on where the poor fucking guy just died after a day and uh, i guess she's she gets what's coming to her set on fire and everything works out for tom everything works out in the end she dies in a a rough day tom had a rough day yeah everything will just go back to being normal for him i'm sure so back in the 1980s somebody else had a rough day satan uh no i think satan had a fine day oh okay unfortunately the rough day was samantha just one quick thing yeah, I mean, I just want to go on record with this stuff. Sure. Because the people, they write us in all the time saying, hey, you guys like this and you didn't say this about whatever. They associate, I mean, we're just one cohesive force. Mm-hmm. People write in and say stuff about uh, how much I love movies that you clearly presented on the show and vice versa. They recite opinions as if I've said them, things that you say. Uh-huh. So they make no distinction between the two of us. And furthermore, they cannot read into what we're saying at right. all. Okay. So, I mean, memory over time, it just dissipates. And I just want to make one thing super clear. So this is a great movie, not just because of the director, but because of the three words prior to the director. And that is written, directed, and edited by Ty West. That's actually West. four words. Five words. Fuck you. It's three words. Written, directed, edited. Ty West. One man, one film, one vision. And I can respect this. Oh, all yeah. Right? For this sure. film is so fucking close to perfect that I just have to chime up and say my one stupid thing. But I mean, I could never in my entire life expect to make a film that is not only this good, but realized that there was something good back in ye old cinema and right. pulled it back up to the modern day. Yeah. And that is simply this. I would have ended the movie after the first black spot where you assume the movie's going to end. There's an additional scene on there. We're a spoiler-inclusive show, Mr. Eric Ingram. Yeah. You would have ended the film after Samantha blows her brains out. Okay, yeah, Samantha blows her brains out. If your protagonist blows their brains out, that's an okay spot to end your film. And that leaves everybody scrambling 
trying to figure out what the fuck happened in the movie and dealing with the ending. I love that she decides, you know what, there's only one way out of this situation, and that way does not include me being alive, and she kills herself. That's fine. You wake up in a hospital, it's not even the suspension of disbelief, I just clearly saw that person pour brains out, because, all right, demons. So, I don't know, Damien Baby kept her alive, whatever, doesn't matter. But then you also have this hospital, which is such a departure from the house we've been in, it's such a separate environment. And then the nurse walks over and says, you're going to be fine, both Both of you. you. It just kind of betrays some of the subtlety. I I feel like the film didn't think it was good enough to have. Yeah, I I think it thinks that it deserved this ending when it has been doing just fine the entire time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's kind of start this film. We we mentioned the theme early on in the intro. Mm -hmm. The theme of our one of the again, we make these themes up as we're going along. Thanks. But this theme is city danger versus suburb danger. And we're saying suburbs loosely because suburbs, as far as I'm concerned, is the places we don't live. Yeah. Yeah. Texas, Arizona, Los Angeles, places like that. Right. Los Angeles is not a city. It's tiny. Look at their skyscraper. Okay. So city danger, it's what happens in stuck. People get hit by cars. You get mugged. You get, you know, there's crime. There is urban violence. It goes right. on gang violence, and it happens a lot. People ask you for change. It's very right. annoying. But I mean, happens, there are dangers in this It city. happens in a very small amount most of the time. Yeah. It happens mugging. a lot, but is not very severe. Mugging is a really good example. Right. A lot of people get mugged. Ain't going to fuck your life up. Right. If there is danger in the suburbs, it's not, oh, I got mugged on my way to school. It's somebody kidnapped me, skinned my legs, and fucked me with a hot cast iron turkey baster. And I'm never going to be the same. No, never again. Yeah, so you mean by comparison. At first I was going to say, well, come on, Michael. People could be fucked up by mugging. But when someone, I don't know, ate your left arm right in front of you, I I mean, you don't, how do you come back from that? You just got to live in the city. That's the way to go. Yeah, these um, these quiet little places have been the wonderful settings for so many of our favorite horror movies. Sure. Well, it's because, the danger of quaintness. Yeah, yeah. Because we can believe, for some stupid reason, that's probably not true at all, that if you live in Texas, there's going to be a chainsaw massacre. Right. And th- well, you don't just have to go to every... Texas to have a chainsaw that massacre. That is true. That is true, my friend. But, uh, I mean, you know, you can believe that that happens there for some stupid reason that, I, you know, if there was a uh, perhaps a train that ran at midnight and included meat on it, mm-hmm. I would believe that people were still being skinned and eaten, uh, visited by aliens, whatever the fuck happened in that movie. So I guess to just to start taking this movie in reverse order, I'll, I'll get away from that in a second. But I thought the first time I watched the movie that perhaps what I didn't like was all of the devil stuff. Yeah. Well, that's how I felt, too, the first time I saw it. Right. Once you figure out what's going on as if that's what's wrong. But We don't like supernatural stuff. Yeah. I'm I'm inclined to disagree with supernatural explanations. Sure, sure. That's our gut reaction because that shit does not actually exist. And it's always a letdown. Takes me out. But yeah. Takes me out. But once we know what's happening, a lot of the films we do on the show now have supernatural shit because we've realized there is a craft of film making that surpasses uh, the personal problems you and i have yeah with paranormal right. nonsense and that craft is you don't tell me they're paranormal before they go on the show i am really sorry about that but the second time through when you're watching this it's so obvious that when devil stuff shows up i mean they've told us that what a hundred times hundred hundred the movie opens 500 times you keep referencing the fives what the fuck are you talking so about? littered throughout the film the first thing i noticed so i am not one for subtlety I mean, bring on the gore, bring on the violence, bring on the tits. I'm not the subtle guy. I'm All sitting right. I'm sitting across the studio from the subtle guy. But here I am watching House of the Devil. The first thing that happens is, I, I'm guessing you were going to mention the devil title card. Yeah, with The right. percentages and the based on a true story. Yeah, the, the stupid thing. about I love that too. Based on a fucking true story. Like, fuck you. But uh, what does it say? Something about government it cover-ups says 70 or something? It says 70% in the 80s, 70% of people believed that satanic cults were around and doing mean things and the government was also covering right. it up from people and 30% of the other and 30% of the population was intelligent. That's essentially what it says. Okay, great. So it says the devil is real and we're going to tell you a story about him. It That's says, the purpose of the title. Yeah, card. mostly. And so then throughout the film, I'm kind of, I've seen the film. I know the devil is coming. Yes. The first thing I notice is she peeks into this billiard room Yeah. and I'm going, Oh wait. Oh, Hey, those, Pool balls were laid out in the shape of a pentagram, right. and immediately something happens in my brain where I have a fucking conniption, and I start seizing. And then when I come to, I start seeing fives everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. There all are five over. roses 
on the fucking stained glass window, the die on the desk is made to have a five on it. There are five windows, five hooks. There are fives planted throughout the film. Like the goddamn pentagram. The pentagram. Yeah. So the movie's screaming at you, there's going to be devil stuff, be ready for that. And then it happens, and you know what, the second time through when you watch it and it happens, I am right there. I'm yeah. like, yeah, Ty West with your dumb devil shit, I am right there. You possess that girl with your demon baby. Does not bother me at all. It's perfect. Bring the on the film Tannis. Is perfect. See, that's the, yeah, bring on the Tannis. That's why I mentioned the ending, because I am that fucking close to calling this a perfect yeah. movie. Not a single flaw with the movie. Well, it Nothing sets, I it could sets even him imagine. up and then knocks him down and then sets one back up again. Yeah, yeah, it sets one back up for no reason. So to start with the brilliance, when we get beyond our title card, whatever stuff, it starts in a house, and I love this. She's buying a house, and I say to myself, wow, I'm really clever. House of the devil, I know what's going to happen here. And then she gets out of the house, and the house just serves as motivation for her to get a she job. She needs $300. Yeah. I mean, I thought the first time I watched this, oh, that's going to be the house of the devil. Sure. She's going to well, move in a house. It's going to be possessed. Of, yeah, you know. And on top of that, the realtor, um, played by Dee Wallace, who is back from um, the remake of Halloween, mm-hmm. the realtor says, you know, I got to take care of some stuff that happened to the girl before you. Yeah. So yeah. I'll have that cleared up by Monday. We'll get you moved in by Friday. Right. And you think, Seems oh, like oh, she's suspicious. In a hurry too. Yes. Suspicious something <laughs> yeah. happened to the person before you, huh? Right. I mean, maybe it did. Maybe she got got fucking raped by devil kin but that's not the house unlike going into stuck and not being suspicious this has devil stuff so my guard is up i'm ready to scoff at the film and tell it whatever i saw that coming and screw you for your stupid devil stuff over here but not only am i suspicious of the initial house but then the pizza scene there's a scene where they're just hanging out at this uh little, little caesar yeah at little caesar's and one of the girls, Megan, says something about how the pizza tastes weird. Right. And at that point, I am transfixed sure. on the pizza. Tannis pizza. I read into every single thing that they're saying, that they're doing. When they glance down at the pizza, I'm thinking there's something funny going on in that pizza. I mean, this is also Ty West who did the new Cabin Fever sequel. Yeah. And I should mention, I was on a podcast called Killer Reviews. I think it was last year. And... um Cabin Fever 2 was coming out, and I said, you know what? That's no Eli Roth, no deal for me. And Ty West came in, and just as a side note, I think he did a pretty good yeah, job with it. Yeah, I love it. But that's a movie where we're dealing with tainted chemicals or whatever, sure. and, well, and that's a way big, goofier. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, yeah, it's a totally different movie. This guy should just be applauded for being able to make polar opposites of movies like this. But so I'm thinking, all right, same thing with the pizza. Some kind of infected pizza, something's going on uh, with the pizza, and I just cannot stop staring at it. The suspicion just continues. I mean, Megan tears down the flyers, and now I'm thinking, all right, this has got to be some kind of weird revenge story where the guy in the house, he just has a temper and he'll be right. fine as long as you don't tear down his flyers. Don't or break his vase. Not knock over his vase. And then, you know, then you'll be punished for that. I want to talk about Tom Noonan in a second because I think he makes the movie. Oh, a yeah, lot of things make sure. the movie. but movie is made. Yes, he is one of the elements. Uh, he's one of the contributors to the film that, you know, I mean, it's pretty unreal watching this guy's performance. But when we're setting up the plot, I mean, forget the pizza, but we're consistently changing the plot elements, almost like the movie is giving you some kind of power play. You know, it's letting you know that the movie's boss, you have no control over that. The guy says he's going to show up, sure, and then he doesn't show up right. for seemingly no reason. Uh, he says that he's going to change the pay. You know what? If you come, I'll give you double the pay. And then they go to the house, and now he's changing the job. It's no longer... Right babysitting sure. now it's old woman sitting and your friend can't stay yeah and your friend can't stay and he doesn't like it when she changes things she brings the friend that is not okay but uh, he continues to change he changes the pay over and over and over just trying to convince her to stay so just in the setup of the movie things have been really really rocky it seems like details you've never quite gotten down what might have been a, a straightforward, the house of the devil, you have to babysit a house and it's spooky haunted and sure. whatever. That could be your one sentence explanation. You could just roll with that. Instead, you're trying to figure out uh, until where the you, devil comes in. Yeah, until you get inside the house. And I guess even then, you don't you don't even know what the setup is. Right. And that's just the movie showing you that it's boss and it's going to fuck sure. with you. And so by the time you get to the house, you have, as far as you're concerned, there's two good guys and everybody else. Right. And the film makes no hesitation to narrow that down by 50%. <laughs> yeah, it does. Well, we should talk about our players here. I mean, you have uh, Mary Warnoff, who plays Mrs. Ullman. 
Uh, we've seen her on the show twice before, I believe. Well, we, yeah. she's been on the show twice, but we've only fucking seen her yeah, once. Yeah, so she was Calamity Jane in Death, Death Race, Race 2000, 2000. Yeah, but also apparently, according to the internet, if you're familiar, the internet is always right. And she played a character named Abby in The Devil's Rejects. Let it be known that Eric Ingram and myself, Michael Kester, do not know what fucking character this was. And we're huge fans of The Absolutely. Devil's Rejects, and we cannot find her. And that's a tragedy, really. That's just selling her short. Uh, and then Megan takes off, and we'll get back to Megan in a second. But let's talk about Tom Noonan. So Tom Noonan, he plays Mr. Ullman. He he shows up and seems more like a caretaker yeah. than uh, a character. Almost as if he's caretaker of the house. Right. Like the house is going to be sure. the haunted thing. But he kind of, he plays this this toned back Vincent Price character. Yeah. And a lot of the time when he's talking, he seems very trustworthy. He seems very cautious, very kind of reserved a very safe character, but at the same time, Vincent Price, you know, coming into play here, he's creepy as shit, and you yeah. can't figure out why. When he's talking to Samantha, explaining the job, changing the rules. On the phone, too. Right, I mean, sure. you first get that on the phone. So, you, I mean, let's talk about our introduction of this guy. You hear him on the phone, and you have that creepy voice. You don't really know what his fucking problem is, why he didn't show up. So that's weird enough. But the scene where you are actually introduced to him... The two characters, the two girls, the beautiful young girls, standing on the this uh, step here, looking into the door, the frame refuses to show you what he looks like. And they're meeting, and he goes to shake Samantha's hand. And he shakes her hand, continues shaking. He's probably looking over at the other girl, but we can't see him. We just get a hand, and you know the movie's teasing you. Mm -hmm. The movie's saying, here is the big bad ultra villain, and he's just hidden away in the shadows. Right. And it's not until the girls say... Well, time to just, you know, there's that last second, like sure. maybe we should bail, but all right, let's just head in the house. And that's when we finally pan up. And for a second, I kind of go, I mean, at this point, you expect Hitler to be at right. the door. This has to be the worst fucking human being. This has to be Mina Savari, who was uh -huh. at the door to this house. And you pan up and you go, well, it kind of looks like a nice dude. Yeah. But he looks around a little, you know, he's a little shifty eyes. But yeah, it looks like a nice enough guy. Right. Well, and then there's the scene where they're sitting at the table discussing details. Oh, yeah. And he seems less like a boss, less like a mean guy, and more, he seems like a therapist's patient. He's sitting there. He won't make eye contact. Right. He's giving far too many personal details to every aspect of what he's right. saying. And every once in a while, when he asks for something, when he needs something, that's when he makes eye contact and you can watch Samantha panic. Yeah. It's like, whoa, hold on. Yeah, sorry. I have to answer you this time. Yeah. And she gives him an answer off the top of her head and then he looks away again and starts going mm -hmm. onto a diatribe of my mother. She's not, it's not that she's not able-bodied. It's right. just, she just needs some looking after. It's as if he's never considered any of this. He doesn't really have a, an ultimate evil badass trick. Yeah, well, it seems like he's sleeve. new to whatever's going yeah, on. Yeah, right. You know, the other scene right before that that I like is when they're all sitting down in the living room and, you know, the film realizes it's being evasive and so do the characters. Megan, actually anxious to figure out who these people are, if she should trust her friend to be there, Megan asks, are you a teacher? And his response is just, no. And there's silence. Right. Uh, as if, hey, are you going to maybe you elaborate on that? This will be... No, not exactly. Yeah, and when she says, are you an astronomer, she is completely aware that his answer was not sufficient last time. She gives this look like this is the fucking Twilight Zone. She looks around like, does no one else realize that this man is being super fucking shady? And asks if he's an astronomer, and he's clearly just not going to tell them what he is. So Megan splits from the house. She kind of pulls over to the side of the road. She starts smoking, and um, our mutual friend Rob Vignison steps out of the shadows. Yeah, right. Rob's an actor, by the way, right. and a fantastic actor, sure. but he's unfortunately not really the guy in this right. film. But the guy that steps out, we can only assume he's their son. They mention they have a kid and then yeah, he's right. grown. So he steps out, lights the cigarette, and he's kind of playing this strange game where he's trying to get Megan to talk. He's right. trying to get her to, I guess, reveal who she is. And she says something, and his immediate follow-up is, oh, you're not the babysitter? And she says, oh, no, and immediately he pulls out a revolver and blows... 40% of her face over the front of the car. Yeah, she doesn't even really get an opportunity to give her long-winded explanation about her. She manages to squeak out my friend or something, and that's it. Without hesitation, takes the gun out, immediately shoots her. I mean, that's the first time that that tension sort of gives a payoff. 
So Tom's character, after you know having this commanding presence for someone who is so submissive, uh, who, who's this oddity that you kind of have to watch because you still don't know what to make of it. Mm-hmm. He leaves, they all leave, and that's when you are left alone in the house. And this is the part where the movie really starts showing off. Sure. I mean, big time. This whole chunk right here. You are um, alone in what you are now aware is the house of the devil, and you don't know where the, you still don't know where the devil's going to show up. Yeah. When the devil's he going to get here? Yeah, and until then, it's just quiet. You're quietly exploring the house, and you're just waiting for it. You are waiting for the fucking moment. And after the, the brains blow out, sure. I mean, you know that something is coming, and it is not going to be good. And it could be around any corner. And so Samantha's bored, and she just keeps going from room to room. And I think that's how you manage to have a movie with so much fucking tension. And there's a lot of stuff the movie does. Um, We could do a whole show just about the fucking tension and how it builds that. But one of the ways is that you continue to move from room to room. So you're exploring the house. You know that maybe when you you finally get the payoff, it's just going to be in one of the rooms. Sure. Maybe one of the rooms is going to reveal a detail, but you're certainly not going to get bored. You right. could just watch Samantha on the couch right. in a creepy way, but eventually you're going to get so used to the situation. Mm-hmm. So you keep moving from room to room. And sometimes, sometimes, brilliantly, the camera stays in the room for just too long after Samantha left. Um, the instance where she's sitting you know, in his chair, uh, right. kind of fucking around at the desk there, and she eventually gets up from the chair and she takes off. And you focus on the chairs if maybe there's something left to see there or in another movie that might be where the scare comes in, but you just stay there too long and then you move on. Right. Then you're ready. Then the film releases you and tells you it's ready to go somewhere else. The silence is finally broken when you get the uh, the little music video. You get yeah. One thing leads to another. Right. On the Sony Walkman, uh-huh. which uh, we'll talk about the style. We'll probably end up talking about the style at the end of this 80s film yeah. this oh, sorry film that is set in the 80s but we'll make that distinction this is probably even scarier for me than when the house is quiet mm-hmm. because you're no longer safe you can't hear what's going on sure. in the house every little creak and bump something happens upstairs you know what's going on now you get one thing leads to another the film's changing things up and i'm going well it's it's setting my guard off and this is when something bad is going to happen and as she continues to explore the house you do get one shot from the basement about halfway through uh, where the camera's down in the basement and looking up at her. And that's the only time that the music is broken. Uh, you just hear it as if you're you're no longer from her perspective. You're right. from the perspective of someone outside. You can tell she's listening to music, but it's quiet again, as if to let you know, wait, the house is still quiet. Anything could happen. And then you go back into it. And when that stops is when she knocks over the vase. Yeah. So this comes back, this is a terrifying moment because now she's done something wrong. And as you're looking around the house for where is the devil, you're also kind of looking for justification, Mm -hmm. right? But why would the house punish her? Yeah, what is she going to do to provoke whatever's about to happen to her? And you know Megan tore down the flyers and got shot in the face. So now you're thinking, oh, she's knocked over this vase. Maybe people are going to come flying out of the room super pissed maybe that's you know what's what's wrong with their mother is she super angry when people knock her vases over or something and so the trouble's going to start things continue you're going upstairs building tension you're sure this is going to be the payoff and then you get the fucking pizza scene right where the guy rings the doorbell sure and you have to go back down for you were so close to going upstairs and figuring out what's happening and you got a fucking rush back down with the pizza the pizza man shows up she basically chucks twenty dollars out the door grabs the pizza box and slams it Camera then does its dramatic pan up to yeah. reveal that it's Sunny Boy again. Yeah, right. Just giving you these small details, uh, the way it kind of fills you in as the movie goes along. Not that you necessarily need to know. At the end, you're still going to get smacked in the face with devil stuff. Uh-huh. But you're kind of figuring out what might be the motivations of these people. Are they, you know, you see that they're willing to kill instantly for whatever their cause is, although you don't know the cause. You're right. still desperately trying to get any clues you can. And I think we know, you know, where that ends up. But before we end our conversation about House of the Devil, I think yeah. we got to talk about the style a little bit. That's a lot of what draws me to the film. It's a lot right. of what makes the film stand out because this has been done. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot. I believe of the Dario... word is Hitchcockian. Yeah, well, were you or going Argento. for the Argento? Yeah. Well, yeah. I always Hitchcock kind of does a lot of masculine stuff, and yeah, Argento right. for me is always the the scared lead that's <laughs> always just looking around. Just right. hoping to find something not scary sure, to sure. cling to. And there's this thing where 
It's all grainy and fuzzy. It looks like the 80s, but we had Mm -hmm. this discussion watching the film. The film is set in the 80s, and it's very strongly set in the 80s. Music, clothing, haircuts. Well, you even talked about the look. I mean, we're dealing with uh, the kind of style when we talked about Black Dynamite. exactly. Equipment over CG. You know, the whole thing is on 16 millimeter film, and it uses a lot of the... uh, the slow zoom stuff that we sure. once upon a time made fun of the 70s and 80s for using that camera work. But that really gives you the feel to one of the many, many things all the way back to set design and right. stuff, too, uh, where you feel like this is, you're in the 80s. Yeah. Here's the difference between this film and Black Dynamite. Black Dynamite wants you be- to believe it's a film that came out in the 70s. It's a film from the era rather than being a film in right, the era. Right, exactly. So House of the Devil is set in the 80s. But the violence isn't, oh, bright red, Jason stabbed me with a harpoon sure. kind of violence. Nothing it's, comic about it. It's serious. This is how people died in the 80s. Yes. Not how people died on screen in the 80s. This is how people died in 1984. Modern sense of realism. Blown but the, off. Right, right. But that's the kind of thing we always call for on the show. When you're going to do the, look, I'm doing the old stuff over here. I mean, this show is born out of Grindhouse. Sure. We understand that stuff and we like that stuff. But it's, it's always a question of what can you improve? You, yeah, you can make a good film by just repeating what was done and what we enjoy. And of course, we're just going to enjoy that again. But how can you build upon that? How can you improve that? And by having a film that seems like it's not the camera just on another 80s film, right? it's us watching something that happens in the... The first time uh, you said something to me about noticing it was when they were in the pizza place. Mm-hmm. And this is really just us sitting down... Uh, you know, it's not giant hairdos. It's nothing comic or ridiculous. It has the kind of reservation that I don't think you or I could even have. Right. I mean, you kind of have to put a joke. Yeah. You, know, you said like a Duran Duran joke uh-huh. or something. I mean, you have to put something in there that says, hey, I'm in 2009 making right. an 80s film. Ty West just has this control, this self-control where he can say, no, I really do want to make a film about the 80s. I want to use some of that convention, take you back to that. But you know what? We've learned a couple things since the 80s about filmmaking. And even if it's not just what we've learned, I know what audiences today, they're not going to jump at bright red blood, whatever. Sure. They can rent that shit from the video store. Right. The reason they're going to come to my film is because they have what was great about that experience coupled with what is great about today's horror experience. Well, that was quite a that was a double feature experience. I wouldn't say horror because I wouldn't call stuck horror. Just two good films back to back, and there is nothing wrong with that. Did you? If you think there was something wrong with that, again, <laughs> yeah. fuck you. Number one, yeah. And number two, double feature show at gmail dot com. That's that's the email address that you use when you hate something we do or blah blah. Go ahead, you can whine. You do your little Tommy whiny bullshit oh, and God. tell us why we're not good at doing whatever. We're no, doing. see what you're doing right now is the thing he did in that movie where he said, oh yeah, I've you know killed plenty of people. I take care of this all the yeah. time. And then it turns out he doesn't fucking know. So we're going to say fuck you, but then when you send us a mean email where our feelings will be hurt. <laughs> Absolutely heartbroken. But if you want to just check out our website where you can't do mean things to us, yes. that's doublefeatureshow.com. We also have an iTunes, which we need some love on, so go leave a little review there. So next time we're going to do... Uh, I- we're not racists on this show, but next time we're going to pick on French people. I like how you uh, took the opportunity to, you know what? I don't think we're going to pick on French people at all. I think we're probably going to bow to the French and how awesome and diverse they're. I, I like how we're using two films to represent sure. all of French. Yeah, we're going to cover uh, Jean-Pierre Junet's Amelie. You've seen it. Watch it again. And then we're going to cover Martyrs, which not only marks a wonderful French horror film, but the first time I'm going to get to do Rape Revenge on Double Feature. Oh, yeah. Jesus. How has it taken so long to do that? We talk. That's another one of those things. It's like fucking uh, that Philip K. Dick movie that yeah. always comes out. It's the Blade Runner of things we actually yeah. want to talk exactly. about on this show. So this is going to be great because usually when we do something like this, oh, Martyrs, for yeah. example, we would do something more like um, a show like Funny Games and Hard Candy. Yeah. And that would just be such a downer. So you thought, well, why don't we do it with Amelie, which yeah. is the happiest French film sure. of all time. The happiest accessible uh, French yeah, film, at right. least for us anyways. For an audience that knows less about French films than mm-hmm. probably we should. So that I think that's kind of the point of seeing those. Right. So I guess for next time, watch Lay Fucking Film. Aloha. Did I fuck up my line? Sorry. <laughs>